Welcome to the lecture series on chemistry under the national program on technology enhanced learning. We have had a number of lectures on the atoms and molecules from the fundamental point of view, namely the quantum chemistry and how we understand them from the principles of quantum mechanics. This is a continuing series of lectures and today it is the ninth lecture. The lecture continues on what we had done earlier, that is the hydrogen atom, the solutions of the hydrogen atom using the Schrodinger equation, which is the fundamental equation for matter at the atomic and subatomic levels, just as the Newton's equations describe matter at the large scale, at the terrestrial and the extraterrestrial scale. We have to follow the solutions of the Schrodinger equation and wherever possible, we should also derive the results of the Schrodinger equations. But considering the limitations on the course, as well as the mathematical background required for the students, we are continuing to look at the solutions of the hydrogen atom. We will continue with that uh, in today's lecture and will hopefully complete the hydrogen atom part today. Okay. The series is by the uh, support of the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning by the Ministry of Human Resource Development and I am in the Department of Chemistry, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Okay. The lecture today continues on model problems in quantum chemistry and we look at the angular solutions as well as the overall solutions of the hydrogen atom today. Okay. So summarizing what this lecture will give you as an, it's an overview, we will continue to look at the solutions of the hydrogen atom. We will go back and look at the rules of quantum mechanics, rules as given by quantum mechanics for analyzing the wave functions and if possible, we will also indicate how to calculate the averages and probabilities in hydrogen atom. So let us look at the solutions, let us review the solutions again. We remember that the hydrogen atom had a wave function which was divided into two parts, a radial part and an angular part. The radial part described the distribution of the wave function as a function of the radial distance from the nucleus. The angular part described how the wave function looks like, how the squares of the wave function will be on a sphere of any given radius, where a sphere of course, any point on the surface of the sphere is described by two angles with reference to the polar axis. So we had the radial coordinate or we had the theta, the angular coordinate as well as the phi coordinate. The radial coordinates and the solution for the radial part gave us a quantum number m and in principle the value of this quantum number can be 1, 2 up to infinity. The number of such radial solutions as we obtain for any given value of n is n square for each value of n. This was the summary of the last two lectures with the details. The wave function for the hydrogen atom was the product of both the radial and the angular part as you see here. The overall wave function is described by three quantum numbers, n being the principal quantum number and L and M being the quantum numbers which are the result of the solutions of the radial as well as the angular part subject to the constraints. And the angular solution was known as the spherical harmonics. The values of L and M were described earlier as L being 0, 1 up to N minus 1 and M being from minus L to plus L. The radial part obviously describes the wave function as it varies with the distance and the radial function also, if you recall from the previous solutions, had certain nodes or certain zeros and the number of such zeros for the radial solution is n minus l minus 1. Thus, if you take a 1s orbital, the n value is 1, the l value is 
for the s corresponding to l equal to 0 and therefore there are no radial nodes for the 1 s orbital because it is 1 minus 0 minus 1. You can compute the radial part the radial nodes using this formula. The energies for the hydrogen atom which is obtained by solving the Schrodinger equation of course comes out to be exactly the same as the energies that were described or that were derived by Niels Bohr without the Schrodinger equation. That is not a surprise because the energies that you obtain as solutions for the hydrogen atom have to be such that they should satisfy the experimental uh, data obtained in line spectra of the hydrogen atom. You remember the, the series, the Lyman series, the Balmer series, the Poisson series, the Bracket series and the Fond series. These series were there as experimental data much before the uh, quantum mechanics uh, described the solution, the, the results. Therefore, it is imperative that any new mechanics either that of Niels Bohr or that of Schrodinger or Heisenberg or any other mechanics accurately accounts for this experimental fact and it is no surprise that the solutions of the hydrogen atom given by Schrodinger turned out to be exactly the same as far as the energies are concerned as calculated by the Niels Bohr formula. But with one difference, Niels Bohr had to introduce this as an arbitrary ad hoc facts, I mean he called them as facts as required, I mean these are assumptions which were required, the assumptions is that the energies of the electron uh, do not vary so long as the electrons are in certain uh, orbit and only when the electron jumps from one or the other that it either emits or it absorbs radiation. No, this was a constraint proposed by Niels Bohr to describe the overall solution. In the case of Schrodinger equation, there is no such artificial constraint. You have to believe that the Schrodinger equation works and if it works and if the wave functions have to satisfy the boundary conditions as is required for differential equations, then the solutions come out naturally and the quantum numbers of this wave equation therefore arise naturally as a result of the boundary conditions. So what is this? In effect it is a new hypothesis instead of the Niels Bohr's condition. Now we have the Schrodinger hypothesis, the Schrodinger equation itself but with one major, very very major difference namely that the Schrodinger equation works for all the other atoms. Niels Bohr's formula worked only for hydrogen atom. The hypothesis is it is still a hypothesis but it is definitely more useful in the sense that it is useful for studying a much larger set of phenomena and in fact all of chemistry ever since 1927 seem to have centered around the solution of the Schrodinger equation as far as obtaining the properties of the atoms from uh, ab initio that is from the beginning without doing any experiments if you want to calculate them the Schrodinger equation seems to be the equation. The electron in the hydrogen atom is obviously described by three quantum numbers and three only and please note that here spin is not a part of the hydrogen atom model that Schrodinger gave. The spin came later sorry the spin was there earlier but it was an ad hoc proposition by Pauli and spin quantum number is a fourth quantum number that was introduced by Pauli and with that the hydrogen atom picture, the electron wave function picture is complete. But spin is not part of the Schrodinger equation that was originally used to solve the hydrogen atom problem. The accounting of the spin into the Schrodinger equation came later by Paul Adrian Maurice Dirac, an English physicist, mathematician and he is often considered the father of quantum mechanics. He introduced very clear and concise mathematical picture for quantum mechanics and it is his work which includes spin, which derives spin as the natural fourth quantum number and therefore with the relativistic mechanics that Dirac 
introduced in the solution of the hydrogen atom equation, this process was complete. It is important to point out here that the book published by Dirac in 1930 and revised a little later, I think around 1959 or so, is still one of the most important works ever to have written, to have been written in quantum mechanics or about quantum mechanics and the title is Principles of Quantum Mechanics. It is extremely important that you have a look at this book sometime or the other. Now, let us examine the wave functions a little more closely together. We were looking at the radial part before, we were looking at the angular part before, but each one of them separately. Now we are going to look at both of them together. So let me rewrite the formula as you have here. The overall wave function, as you recall, is psi n l m or theta phi is the radial part r n l of r y l m of theta phi, which is the formula that you see here. Okay. Now, the radial part contains an exponential e to the minus r times the charge of the nucleus z by n a naught, where n is the principal quantum number and a naught is a constant known as the Bohr radius. Its approximate value is 0.53 angstrom. Its approximate value is 0.53 angstrom. The, it contains a quantum number n. That is the principal quantum number. The radial part does not become 0 at r equal to 0, then it is an S function. That is something which you have to remember. That is L equal to 0 for the S function. The radial part, if it has the formula r raised to some power L, where L is the orbital angular momentum quantum number, r raised to L and multiplied by a polynomial which is n minus L minus 1 of order, then it is a radial function of any specific value n and L. L equal to 1 means P, which means it is R and n minus 2 the power. When L is 1, this is n minus 2 is the order of the polynomial multiplied by R. That is a P orbital and then L equal to 2 means a D orbital and so on. So the functional form of the radial part, the functional form of the radial part can be an indication of the quantum numbers and the type of the orbital that one is interested in. Okay. Let us look at the radial functions one after the other and then we will look at the radial function squared. First let us plot the radial functions for the several values of n equal to 1, 2, 3, etc. with the appropriate values of L. The ground state or the state with the least amount of energy n equal to 1, the first state and then L is 0 is the only possible value. The radial part is exponential minus that r by a naught times a constant. If you plot this as a function of r, you see this is nothing other than an e to the minus r. It is an exponential which drops off to 0 as r goes to infinity. But the point to remember is that the function is not 0 at r equal to 0. Okay. The next one, when you plot this at n equal to 2 and l equal to 0, you see that there is a 1 minus z r by 2 a naught, there is a monomial and then exponential minus z r by 2 a naught. When you plot this function at r equal to 0, this function is again non-zero. So you start from somewhere and this goes to 0 when this part becomes 0. That is z r by 2 a naught is equal to 1. That value of r is given by that. And for any value of r greater than that, this function is negative but it keeps on going and you see that it uh, is brought back to 0 by the exponential. So this is the radial function for n 2 l 0. Likewise, for n equal to 2 and l equal to 1, you have r raised to l which is l equal to 1 here. So it is r to the power 1 and the polynomial goes to 0 because n is 2, l is 1, n minus l minus 1, it is 0. Therefore, there is no, there is no polynomial here, only r and an exponential minus z r by 2 a naught 
and you see that this has a simple function that r increases exponential decreases so there is a competition and after a maximum the exponential brings everything back to zero this is the radial function for n equal to 2 l equal to 1 2p type of orbitals when n is equal to 3 l equal to 0 it is 3s orbital and you see that r raised to l l is 0 so there is a a quadratic function here a function a constant times r and an r square and an exponential this quadratic has two zeros two roots where this function goes to zero those two roots are these two points when you plot them when you put r equal to zero this is non zero so you start again from a non zero value for the radial function and an exponential these two roots and then the function goes to zero because of the exponential so you see that there is an alternating sign for this wave function we'll do just two more of them n equal to 3 and l equal to 1 corresponding to 3p r raised to l which is r raised to 1 n minus l minus 1 which is obviously a polynomial of degree 1 exponential minus z r exponential minus z r by 3 a naught and you see that this goes to 0 only once and this never goes to 0 except at infinity so you have one node and the radial node is one node for n equal to 3 l equal to 1 and the function goes like this the last n equal to 3 and l equal to 2 r square e to the minus z r by 3 a naught it never goes to 0 it starts with a 0 and you see that this is a straightforward plot of the r square e to the minus z r by 3 a naught. So, if you put all these plots together for a given value of n, you see that there is a radial function which is this is a 2 s and this is a 2 p. The curve with the two radial nodes is a 3 s, the curve with one radial node is a 3 p and the curve with no radial node is a 3 d. You have to remember that the radial nodes decrease as you go from s to p to d etc because it is n minus l minus 1. So, as l increases the number n minus l minus 1 keeps on decreasing until it becomes 0. Okay. So, the, the picture also tells you where the radial nodes are for a given value of n relative to each other. Now, all of this is for the radial function. But then we also know that the wave function itself does not have an interpretation. There is no physical interpretation for the wave function. It has to be because otherwise we have a problem. You have a wave function which starts off with a non-zero value at r equal to zero. What does that mean? That means that the electron has a finite, uh, I mean some function at the nucleus. It does not make sense. The wave function is not to be interpreted, but it is the absolute square of the wave function which is to be interpreted as a probability density. So, what exactly is the formula? For this wave function, what is the probability interpretation? Psi star or theta phi psi, this is for any value of n l m, psi n l m same ones or theta phi product okay. that is the function and its complex conjugate multiplied or the absolute square of the wave function over a small interval of space let me call them d tau here gives you the probability of finding the electron in that space d tau where this d tau is centered at some value of r theta and phi it is r plus dr theta plus d theta phi plus phi d phi in the small region what is the probability of finding the electron that is the only interpretation that can be given by the presence of this wave function by the short solution of the Schrodinger equation and the star is extremely important here because you remember that the spherical harmonics which is part of the hydrogen atom solution has complex quantities in them therefore if you forget the star you are going to make uh, mistakes any real number can be obtained from a complex number by taking the absolute square of the complex number and here probabilities are real can be measured therefore they have to be interpreted and this interpretation was due to Max Born I told you earlier 
and in fact Schrodinger himself did not make such an interpretation for the wave function, but it was Max Born who did that uh, several years later. Now with that sort of an interpretation what is the d tau? Supposing we were to write the wave function as psi x y z psi star x y z, then it is very clear to us what is a d tau. You recall the particle in the 1D and the 2D box. The d tau was something like a dx, let me write d tau here and d tau is like a dx, dy, dz, a volume element. What exactly does this mean? This means the probability of finding the particle, finding the particle in the region enclosed between x, y, z and x plus dx, y plus dy, z plus dz. That is if you draw a small rectangular volume element from x to x plus dx, y to y plus dy, z to z plus dz as the appropriate sides, the probability of finding the particle in that volume element is given by psi star psi. That is the only interpretation given. Now, in Cartesian coordinates, the volume elements are easy to write. D tau is as I wrote dx, dy, dz. But in the case of spherical coordinates, the d tau is not the dx, dy, dz, but elementary mathematics tells us that it is r square dr sin theta d theta d phi. This is the volume element in spherical coordinate system r square dr sin theta d theta d phi. It is not dr d theta d phi. Please remember this. Now, this r square will play a critical role in our interpretation of the radial function in terms of a probability density. How? Let us see that. So, let us look at the, the slide. I have said that the uh, star denotes the complex conjugate psi star psi is the probability of finding the electron in the region d tau. And in three dimensional space I also said that dx, dy, dz is the volume element. What is the space for the electron? It is all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity for the x, y and z that is the entire universe. But however, it, the entire universe does not really make sense for us because you remember that there is a fundamental unit which governs the exponentials. The exponentials are exponential minus r by a naught, where a naught is the Bohr radius 0.53 angstroms. Therefore, if r is about 5 a naughts, 5 times the Bohr radius, the factor is an exponential to the minus 5. Exponential to the minus 5 decreases, it is pretty close to 0. An exponential to the minus 10 is even closer to 0. Therefore, even though this mathematical limit is required for us to do the interpretation of the electron probabilities in consistent to the mathematical description, we do not really need large values of x, y, z because of the fact that the exponential is tapered off by the values of a naught by the Bohr radius. Therefore, the universe, the electron can be anywhere in the universe, but its likelihood of being far away from the hydrogen atom, if that electron were to be near the hydrogen atom and if it is to be far away from the hydrogen atom, the probabilities in these two cases will be quite drastically different. Anything more than 10 atomic radii, we do not have to worry about the electron as the electron belonging to that atom or to that uh, nucleus. But this mathematical limit is something that you have to keep in mind. It is an or, it's an sort of an arbitrary, it is not an arbitrary limit, it is required to do the algebra, but it is not very meaningful in practical interpretations. What is the probability of finding the electron anywhere in the universe? Obviously, you know, if the electron was there with the hydrogen atom to begin with, it is going to be in the universe all the time, somewhere. 
Therefore, the overall probability is when you say the integral z integral y integral with respect to x, all this means is that you are adding these probabilities for every possible values of x, y and z. Integration means addition for continuous variables x, y and z. Therefore, when you add all these probabilities, it has to be 1. So, this is the conservation of the total number of electrons with the hydrogen atom. If the electron and the atom, the nucleus were to be studied in the beginning, the electron remains throughout. The total probability of finding the electron anywhere in the universe is a certainty or is 1. In spherical polar coordinates, as I told you, that integration now takes a different form. The dx dy dz is now replaced by r square sin theta dr d theta d phi. And the limits of integration are now for the radial coordinate, it is between 0 and infinity. It refers to the sphere and the theta coordinate is between 0 and pi and the phi coordinate is between 0 and 2 pi. Therefore, we can easily rewrite this mathematical statement namely the integral dz, the integral dy, the integral dx between the limits minus infinity to plus infinity in all these three cases psi star psi is equal to 1 using spherical polar coordinates namely we will write it in this form. Let us write this slowly using this formula for d tau we can write the integral psi star psi d tau as okay, its triple integral as r square dr where r goes from 0 to infinity sin theta d theta where theta goes from 0 to pi and d phi where phi goes from 0 to 2 pi this is the integral limits then psi star n l m or theta phi psi n l m or theta phi. This is the probability interpretation in spherical coordinates and this probability because we are calculating over the entire universal uh, universe entire universe this is equal to 1. Now, you see that we are able to write the integral as a dr, a d theta and d phi and we know the functional forms for the psi star and psi in terms of the r and theta phi. You know this is given by the radial function and this is given by the uh, angular function spherical harmonics. Therefore, it is possible to do these integrals fairly easily. So, let me just complete this part by writing psi n l m as r n l of the radial coordinate and y l m theta phi as the angular coordinate. Therefore, the overall triple integral that you have had is written as an integral involving a radial part and an integral involving the angular part which you can write as r goes from 0 to infinity r square. Now, we have to take psi star psi which means r n l r star r n l r psi star psi. This is the radial part of the integral r square d r psi star psi, but containing only the radial part. This is everything that depends on the radial coordinate. Therefore, this is the integral that we need to evaluate as far as the radius coordinate r is concerned. What are the theta phi parts multiplied by the integral theta is equal to 0 to pi sin theta d theta. Let us also do this phi equal to 0 to 2 pi d phi. Okay. Now, we have got the theta phi dependent angular function which is y l m theta phi star multiplied by y l m theta phi itself. So, this is the angular part. So, you see the angular part integration as that containing the theta phi integration 
and then the radial part integration containing the R integration. Now, the interpretation for the probability is now meaningful when you include this R square as part of the radial probability distribution. Now, let us go back to the slide. So, what I have done is to write this radial part R square dr or n l or star the radial integral and then there is the angular integral and if it is taken over all the limits for all the three variables then this is equal to 1. Okay. Therefore, you see the probability density when we talk about the radial distribution is no longer simply the capital R squared, but it is also the product of the little r squared and the radial function squared. That is, it is this part r square capital R and the capital R. Together, it is called the radial probability distribution function and this has definitely a meaningful interpretation as far as the likelihood of finding the electron uh, away from the nucleus is concerned. Okay. Now, the regions in which the probability is near 0 are called the nodal regions and the point at which the probability is 0, okay, there is nothing called the probability of finding the electron at this point is 0 or at that point is 0. No, there is no such interpretation like finding the probability at a particular point. These are all continuous variables. Therefore, we can only talk about a probability density and the probability density can be 0, but the probability itself is meaningful only when you talk about a small region of space. And therefore, whenever you have a small region of space, the probability is never 0. It may be extremely small, but it is never, never, ever 0. Okay. Please keep that in mind. In the regions in which the probability is near 0, these are called the nodal regions. The probability of finding the electron is very small or negligible, but never 0 because we do not talk about the probability densities, but we do talk about the probabilities as themselves. Okay. Let us now plot the squares of the radial functions along with the r. Okay. So, let us go back now, look at the n equal to 1 and l equal to 0. This plot has to be contrasted with the earlier plot of the radial function r. The radial function, if you remember, was a simple exponential. The radial function was a simple exponential, r of r versus r. This was from the previous plot. Now, you look at the radial probability function, which is multiplied by r square and the capital R square. See, now it is rightly 0 at the nucleus and it increases to a maximum value and then it goes down. So, in this region, the likelihood of finding the electron is in this value of r, the corresponding value of r is corresponding value of r is uh, somewhere between uh, 0 0.53 and 0 0.7 around that. Finding the electron in this region, the probability is the maximum and then the as you go farther away, the likelihood of finding the electron also becomes very small. This is for the n equal to 1, l equal to 0 case. So, this is the 1s orbital. Therefore, for 1s orbital, the electron probability is very near the nucleus maximum. Let us go to 2s, n equal to 2, l equal to 0. For 2s, you see the probability of finding the electron is maximum slightly farther away from the nucleus. But there is a small region where the probability is also a local maximum and then it increases to a much larger value slightly far away. That means, the 2s orbital is extended in space with a likelihood of finding the electron near the nucleus some value, but a, most of its probability is farther away from the nucleus, farther away from the 1s region. That is, the 2s orbital is the outer orbital, if you compare the language of the Niels Bohr, the n equal to 1 is the first shell, the n equal to 2 is the second shell, the 2s is, now you no longer talk about a shell or an orbital, but you talk about a region of space where the probability of finding the electron is high and the 2s 
orbital gives you that concept. And this value is roughly close to the value of the, uh, the radius that Niels Bohr derived. Therefore, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the particulate model that Niels Bohr had and the wave function model that uh, Schrodinger's uh, equation proposes that you replace the electron dot by an electron cloud such that the density of finding the cloud in that region is the maximum. This is for 2p, n equal to 2, l equal to 1. The radial probability density is now, you see there is a maximum. This maximum also is very near the maximum of 2s. You look at these values here. See, this is z by a naught. There is a, an r value. This is a, scaled to this Bohr radius a naught. So what you have here is approximately around 5 and for 2p is also approximately around that region. So you see that 2s and 2p nearly occupy the same region but slightly different of course. Go to the n equal to 3, l equal to 0 which is a 3s orbital and now the density of finding the the probability density or the likelihood of finding the electron is uh, farther away from the nucleus is more, but you see 1, 2. There are two nodal regions corresponding to this value 0, 0 here. The probability is 0 of course at the nucleus or probability density is 0 at the nucleus and then you have these two nodes and then there is a likelihood of finding the electron. The 3s orbital is extended in space farther from the 2s orbital. This is the 3p orbital which has one node and the region of space where the bulk of the likelihood of finding the electron is in quite far away from the nucleus compared to the 2s. This is the 3d corresponding to n equal to 3 and l equal to 2 and again there is no node. The region is reasonably flat and the likelihood is again farther away from the nucleus. Therefore, the radial functions, if they are plotted, they only tell you approximately the values for which the radial probability density is 0 or high. But you have to remember that the radial probability distribution has an additional factor of the little r squared. That little r squared comes from the volume element in spherical uh, polar coordinates. And that volume element ensures that there is a reasonably correct interpretation for the uh, distribution of the electron probability as one moves away from the uh, nucleus. If you put the probabilities together for the n equal to 2 case, you see this is the one with the node is 2s and the one without the node, the red line, the line that you see here without the node is 2p radial probabilities. And if you put all the three uh, the three orbitals, the n equal to three orbitals, the one with the two nodes, the blue curve has the two nodes, these two, with the two max, three maxima, that is a 3s. The red curve which has one node is a 3p and the green curve which has no nodes is the 3d and you see the maxima are roughly close to each other. They are not very far away but they are considerably far away from that of the n equal to two case as you see here. The n equal to 2 case, as you see, they are quite far away. The n equal to 3 case is somewhere in this region. Okay. So the concept of the Bohr radius and the Bohr shell, n equal to 1, n equal to 2, n equal to 3, is now reinterpreted in terms of the probability densities as uh, the regions where the likelihood of finding the electrons is maximum. Let us see how many such orbitals are there for any given value of m. I told you that it is n square. We will now substitute the numbers and see that that is what we get. For n equal to 1, l is equal to 0 is the only possible value. There is no m, m equal to 0. Therefore, there is only one such solution, 1s. Yes. Let me write the solutions in the indexed form. n equal to 1, l equal to 0. Therefore, m is 0. The wave function psi is 1, 0, 0. This is n, l, m. The wave function is r theta. Let me get rid of the r. r theta phi is 
obviously radial n is 1, l is 0, 1, 0 of r, y, l is 0, m is 0, y, 0, 0, theta phi. Okay. This is 1 s orbital. It is not just the angular part, it is a radial and the angular part put together. Next, n equal to 2, there are two possibilities for the L, L equal to 0 is one choice, L equal to 1 is the other choice, for L equal to 0, M is 0, for L equal to 1, you have got three choices, namely M equal to 1, 0 and M equal to minus 1, okay. M equal to 0 and minus 1. So, what are the three, the four wave functions that you have? Yes, this is also n equal to 2 here. So, the four possible wave functions that you talk about are psi 2, 0, 0, psi 2, 1, 1, psi 2, 1, 0 and psi 2, 1, minus 1. This is the 2 p z orbital. This, the real part, the real part or the imaginary part of these give you the 2 p x and the 2 p y orbital. This function is complex, but you have to take linear combination of this function and its complex conjugate to get the p x and the p y. But there are three such p orbitals, one therefore there is a total of four orbitals. Now we look at the n quantum number for n equal to 3, three possible values l equal to 0, l equal to 1 and l equal to 2. For 0, you have got m equal to 0. For 1, you have got m equal to 1, 0, minus 1. And for 2, you have got m equal to 2, 0, 1, 2, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2. So, you have got 5 functions. So, you have got 1 plus 3 plus 5, a total of 9 functions for n equal to 3. And these 9 wave functions are the 9 orbitals, but you have to remember when it comes to d orbitals and p orbitals, we do not take the m values as they are, but we take linear combinations of them. For example, for m equal to 2 and minus 2, if we take the linear combinations, as I said in the last lecture, you get the d x square minus y square orbital or you get the d x y orbital. Okay. But the point is, there are 5 d orbitals there are 3 p orbitals and there is 1 s orbital for the n equal to 3 case. So, there is a total of 9. So, this is the table which gives you that number. So, n equal to 2, l equal to 0, 2 s 1 orbital, 2 p 3 orbital, n is 3, l is 0, 3 s 1 orbital, n is 3, l equal to 1, 3 p 3 orbitals, n equal to 3, l equal to 2, 3d 5 orbitals. So, that is a total is 1 plus 3 plus 5 is for the n equal to 3 case, 9 of them. And for n equal to 4, you can likewise show an s orbital, 3p orbitals, 5d orbitals and 7f orbitals leading to a total of 16. And therefore, for any given value of n, there are n square orbital as you have studied them in the earlier chemistry courses, except that now you know what those wave functions are and what the products of the angular and radial parts of them uh, turn out to be. So, the solution for the hydrogen atom, what we have done so far in this lecture is to uh, look at the solutions from the radial part and the angular part and then bring them together and determine what are called the radial probabilities, the radial wave functions as they are and then the square of the radial function multiplied by the r square to give you what is called the radial probability distribution and then look at the basic rules. The averages and probabilities of hydrogen atom, let me indicate to you. The calculations are somewhat tedious, but you must know how to do the calculations. So, let me do that process here in the next 10 minutes. We will go through formal algebra here. Please recall that the expectation value of any observable in quantum mechanics from the previous lectures, I have given as the integral with the operator corresponding to the expectation, the value, the observable operator between the two wave functions psi star a psi d tau divided by psi star psi d tau. This is a postulate. 
This is a postulate in quantum mechanics. We will have to take this as given and we have to work with it and feel comfortable about how to manipulate this for various cases. We have already done this for a particle in a one dimensional box. If you remember the average value for the position for a particle in a one dimensional box was calculated as 2 by L, this is a few lectures ago now, 2 by L sin square n pi x by L x dx between 0 and L. And this came out because you have this wave function is psi n of x is root 2 by L sin n pi x by L. This was the wave function. So, if you put this in here, put the x in here and put the wave function again, you will get this result. And you calculated this to be L by 2, the average value of x. Okay. So, this was already done. Now, except that in the case of hydrogen atom, we have got three variables to take care of and therefore, we have got these three functions to worry about okay, in taking the average values. So, even in the simplest case of calculating, what is the average radius for the electron in the ground state, that is in the lowest energy state, in the lowest energy state corresponding to psi 1 s or psi 1 0 0. The principal quantum number is 1, the L values is 0 and the M values is 0. What is the average value for this radius? Even this will be somewhat long expression, but it is doable because it involves simply exponentials. So, what you have to do is what is the average value for the radius or if you do that the question the answer to that is psi star 1 0 0 or theta phi or psi 1 0 0 or theta phi. The d tau is now dr with r square d theta sin theta d phi. So, it is a triple integral. This is what you have to calculate, but you see that this is involving only the value r and you remember that the ground state wave function has a spherical harmonic y 0 0 corresponding to this. y 0 0 is independent of the functions. If you recall y 0 0 theta phi was 1 by root 4 pi. Okay. What is the origin of that is right here. Okay. It is a normalization constant for the function y 0 0. If it is independent of theta and phi, the angular part is d theta sin theta d phi between the integrals. So, let me do this calculation now. You have the radial function 1 0 of r integral or and again the radial function 1 0 of r, it is a real function, so star is not needed. Then there is r square dr multiplied by the integrals y 0 0 theta phi square sin theta d theta d phi. Okay. This is how you calculate the expectation values of quantities for the hydrogen atom and here the expectation value that we calculate is the average value for the radius of the electron. I mean how far away it is from the nucleus, the average value. You cannot locate the electron into a particular point because quantum mechanics, the wave function model precludes such a description. But on the average, where are we likely to find the electron? The value is given by this expression and you have r 1 0 of r times the r and this integral the calculation times this integral. The calculation of this is very straightforward. This is straight away one can do this. You remember that y 0 0 is 1 by root 4 pi, therefore the square of this is 1 by 4 pi and it is independent of theta and phi and r. Therefore, the integral for theta and phi can be done as sin theta d theta d phi. This integral between 0 
to pi for d theta and 0 to 2 pi for d phi. You can show that this whole thing is 1. The angular part, let me write this again, this whole integral 1 by 4 pi integral 0 theta is equal to 0 to pi sin theta d theta integral phi equal to 0 to 2 pi d phi this integral is 1. Okay. Therefore, the radial part the average value r is essentially integral r goes from 0 to infinity r square dr and then you have got the radial function r 1 0 of r the operator corresponding to the radial the radius and r 1 0 of r. This is the only integral that you need to calculate. Now you see that the separation of the variables in terms of spherical polar coordinates has its advantages when you calculate the properties of the electron where is the uh, what is the average value of the radius of the electron? What is the average value for the, uh, the momentum of the electron? Okay. So if you want to calculate every such averages, all you need to know is the corresponding operator associated with the property that you want to measure and then put the operator between the two wave functions and calculate the integral. Okay. So let me conclude this lecture with the following two or three problems for the hydrogen atom to be considered by you. This covers the last three or four lectures. So let me write the first problem as 1 from the tables of functions given or in L of R and Y L M of theta phi, write down the wave function psi 2 0 0 or theta phi wave functions and psi 3, 1, 1 or theta and phi. This is a straightforward multiplication, but please go, please do this exercise by writing the individual wave functions. Second, normalize the function psi of r given by a constant times an exponential minus z r by a naught. If I do not give you this constant, how would you get the normalization constant of this wave function? Remember the normalization constant is obtained by the following method. If the wave function is given as psi, the normalization means that the integral psi star psi d tau, if it gives you a value of n, the normalized wave function psi is psi is given by, you replace the psi by 1 by square root of n psi. Then the wave function is said to be normalized. So this is the normalization constant which is obtained by taking the, the square of the absolute square of the wave function and integrating over the space that is available. The only tricky part that you have to remember in this problem with respect to exponential minus z r by a naught and c is that psi of r is given as r theta phi as nothing but c e to the minus z r by a naught. There is no theta phi part, it is independent of that. Therefore, what is meant by normalization when you write psi star psi d tau? The normalization means that you calculate c square okay, e to the minus 
z or by a naught square or square d or you remember that this is the radial part that you have to consider with respect to the wave function it is not enough also this is multiplied by the corresponding angular part the angular part is simply that is d theta sin theta d phi okay. so all that we have done is the integral d tau in this case is a triple integral corresponding to the fact that it is r square d r d theta sin theta the function that you are asked to normalize does not depend on theta and phi therefore this is taken out and this you know uh, the the value of this if you calculate using simple integral it is 4 pi and all you need to do is to calculate the integral this c square times and you should set this equal to 1 to calculate the value of c okay. so this is somewhat difficult but it gives you a a little bit of the mathematics involved in handling the wave functions so let me summarize the purpose of uh, going through the hydrogen atom in all these details we have not solved the schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom but we have looked at the solutions of the hydrogen atom and tried to analyze them the important part is that remember that it is done in a spherical coordinate system and it is split into variables which can be handled independently and the description of the wave function in terms of the probabilities involves a radial probability and an angular probability the visualization of these functions the angular part of this gives you a mental picture about the likelihood of the distribution of these wave functions and so on hydrogen atom wave functions are fundamentally important in the study of the uh, chemistry of the atoms and molecules in fact all the energy levels of the atoms or based on the classification of the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. So, we will continue this in the next lecture. Thank you.